Thanks once again to our choir and all of our worship leaders this morning. I've known George Duncan for a lot of years, and George and Ruth were sitting here when I came into the uh, room this morning, a little bit early. Uh, and George said, what about this sermon title? The sermon title today is Get the Point. And he said, you left off a word. And I said, well, what's that? He said, guard. We need to get the point guard. But George, I don't think that's where I was. You're ahead of me, as always, but, but not exactly where we're going today. I have wonderful memories, I really do, of the Christmas season and, and spring break family vacations that we had in Delray Beach, Florida. We stayed with my in-laws who lived on A1A, the beach road, and the place was absolutely beautiful. It was secluded, yet it was close to everything, and it was also free, which made it very nice. On one of those trips, we visited a very large church with a nationally known pastor just a few miles away in Boca Raton. The pastor, who I do believe was a former Arthur Murray dance instructor, had a voice to die for. It was deep and, and melodious. And he began by saying that he would be preaching a 15-point sermon on manna, God's provision for the children of Israel in the wilderness. A 15-point sermon. 15 points. I'm a Baptist. We preach three-point sermons. So help me, if I was going to deliver a 15-point sermon, I wouldn't tell you in advance. <laughs> and I made a little chart on the worship folder, and I did my best to keep up with the different points, but I got lost somewhere between points seven and nine. But not to worry, to keep all of us point-challenged worshipers on track, at about the 25-minute mark, the pastor actually said, and 11thly, that was the first time in my life I had heard the phrase, and 11thly, I certainly never expected to hear it in a sermon. Well, obviously, I don't have a voice to die for, so this morning, we're going to be going in the opposite direction. I hope to preach a one-point sermon, and the one primary point is this, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you. And the Bible tells us so because the Bible tells us of Jesus' passion. Bob Browning has shared with us that when he really wants to get to know someone, he asks them what they are passionate about. That's what Carrie Beth did in the children's sermon. What was the passion of Jesus? Well, certainly it was more than the title of a Mel Gibson movie. It was more even than that last week in Jerusalem. What was the driving force in his life? What was Jesus passionate about? And thankfully, our text from John's Gospel tells of three key elements of Jesus' passion. Starting with verse 20 of chapter 12, we learn that some Greeks asked to see Jesus. And Philip and Andrew go to him, and Jesus responds with an interesting comment. The hour has come, he says, for the Son of Man to be glorified. And Jesus is speaking here of timing. Timing is very important. And timing is important really in every phase of our lives, but I believe in the sports world it's absolutely crucial. After playing college football for Michigan, he was drafted 199th overall by the New England Patriots in the sixth round of the 2000 NFL Draft. Nine Super Bowl appearances and six Super Bowl championships later, quarterback Tom Brady is considered the biggest steal in the history of the NFL Draft. He is the GOAT. He is the greatest of all time. But his greatest strength is not his arm. It's certainly not his football mind, not even his field vision. His greatest strength is his timing. More than any quarterback in history, Tom Brady delivers the ball on time. His timing is impeccable. Our scripture today speaks to Jesus' timing. It's time, the time has come to, for Jesus to give his life for all people. It's time for Jesus to show the world just how much he loves us, all of us. 
In our Old Testament reading that we read together from Psalm 51, we encounter a broken king. Confronted by the truth in the form of the prophet Nathan, David comes clean. He owns up to the fact that he's the man and he humbles himself before God. It was time to start the healing process. But first must come confession. So mighty King David says this, I know what I did and I, I can't get it out of my mind. In Eugene Peterson's message version, David says, I know how bad I've been. My sins are staring me down. Have you ever been at the point, ever been at the time, when your sins are staring you down? All of us, of course, have those moments. I will never forget the pain in the eyes of a very, very broken man who sadly told me, this, this house of cards that I've built is, is crashing all around me. His sin was staring him down. It was his time. You know, sometimes I believe that we have staring down sins even as a people. And when we do, we need to get down on our collective needs. We need to humble our high and mighty selves. And we need to pray that the Lord God will heal our land. Perhaps it's such a time for America even today. So Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now we know the people have sought glory for thousands of years, but not this kind of glory. This is not the glory of fame, but it is the glory of shame. It's not the glory of Facebook or Twitter, but it's the glory of isolation. Yet it's the real thing. It's authentic glory because it was for us. Because it was, and this is big, it was instead of us. And Jesus knew that before victory would come defeat, before the throne would come the cup, before the light of Sunday, there must be the darkness of Friday. And even at the very moment, the crowds were whooping it up and waving palm branches as Jesus rode into town on Palm Sunday. Jesus knew better. He knew the magnitude of the problem. Jesus understood the solution. And that knowledge was the source of his agony. This was his glory, his hour. It was the hour to which every word of scripture had pointed. Yet Jesus was in agony because he knew the shadow of the cross was narrowing. The greatest act of love ever known was about to commence. As Peterson translates it, time's up. It's time for Jesus to show his love. And John's Jesus continues saying this, Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And those who love their life will lose it. Those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. And whoever serves me, the Father will honor. This passage is part of a common theme of Jesus preaching in the kingdom. Up is down, first is last, losing is saving, and death is life. Now trust me now, I was raised in South Louisville, and I'm no farmer, but I've been told that each little grain of wheat has sort of a hard husk within its life is contained. If it falls into the ground, then the husk softens and finally sort of breaks open. And then from inside the seed, the, the power of its life pushes out. And the pattern of life begins to unfold and, and roots go down and a shoot comes up into the light where it grows stronger and taller and produces a single plant. By harvest time, there will be 40 seeds where before there was only one. And in the next year, if those seeds happen to fall on good soil, they will produce 
1,600 seeds, in the third year, 64,000, in the fourth year, two and a half million. But only if that first seed falls to the ground and dies. And that's how Jesus offers bread to the whole world. He offers himself, his life, to come alive in hundreds and then thousands and then millions of others. But first, he must die. And if we, who claim to be his followers, wish to pass on his life, then we too must learn to live with this pattern. We bear fruit only when we die to self. And that's even true for the church, for the body of Christ. You know, we may live sort of in the upper quadrant, but we Kentuckians still live in what is known as the Bible Belt. And a 2012 study found that 74% of Kentuckians identified themselves as Christians, as believers. Now, that's a lower percentage than those who identified themselves as UK basketball fans, but it's still a strong number. A similar study done in 2019, just last year, saw that number fall to 52%, just barely over half. And the survey authors say this reflects a growing general rejection of organized religion. I guess we should invite them to Calvary where we're not all that organized. But, but you know, that's, that's got to be wrong. How can the world reject and, and withdraw from a community of faith that's the very embodiment of Jesus' passion, of Jesus' love? Maybe they really don't know us. Or maybe they do. Perhaps we've backed off just a bit from that dying to self and the, the world sees us no differently than all those other self-centered groups who seem to want their piece of the pie. But the true church, the authentic church, is different because it is passionate about the priorities of Jesus. To use a Baptist term that I grew up with, we need to have a burden, a burden for the lost, and we need to be developing disciples as we coach up people in the faith and as we send them out for justice-centered, people-reaching, Christ-like service. You know, Jesus and people like the Apostle Paul wouldn't know what to make of a church that's no longer in the business of making more disciples. While the mission of the church is, is more than growth, it's not something other than growth, and it's certainly not decline. In the New Testament, any church bold enough to preach the word, any church refusing to accept the way things are as an eternal given, any church that's willing to suffer for the truth will grow in Christ. And that was true then, and I believe that that is true now. Jesus died to self because he loves us. And we die to self because we love Jesus and all those for whom he died. And everyone, everyone is on that list. No list you will ever find is more inclusive. Authentic, Christ-like love makes a difference in this world. And that difference is duly noted by this world. Well, finally this morning, Jesus turns inward Certainly his own soul is troubled by what he knows is coming. But what should I say, Jesus asked, Father, save me from this hour? No, no. Jesus answers his own question. That's the reason I've come to this hour. And then scripture says that Jesus hears God's voice affirming what Jesus is doing and what he must do. And Jesus tells the crowd that God's voice is to help them believe. He promises to draw all people unto himself. Have you ever heard the voice of God affirming the kingdom work that you are doing? Last Sunday morning, we affirmed that God is strong enough, strong enough loves us enough to weep with us. But God also loves us enough to speak to us through people 
in circumstances, in scripture, in prayer, any other medium that God happens to choose. And this is a scripture text that is about purpose. And Jesus knows his purpose. He knows what he's here to do. And what should I say? He asked the skepticism simply ringing in his words, Father, save me from this hour? No. It is for this reason I have come to this hour. Jesus' life and presence on this earth has a purpose. What could be the point if at the end he turned away from his purpose because it was too difficult, too hard? The meaning of his life is wrapped up in his actions, what he does, and his preaching can only be as powerful as what he does. And Jesus' purpose was both ominous, that's where the, the agony part comes in, and life-giving, that is the glory part. The sun was troubled, and heaven answered, and the Lord God answered the sun's prayer with an articulate voice. And yes, it was agony for Jesus to do the will of his Father. It was agony for Jesus to bring glory to his Father. It was agony for Jesus to take on our sin. But there was no other way. No other way. The most drastic problem of all, the sin problem, required the most radical solution of all, and that is Jesus. If it were possible to get right with God on any other terms, well, then the cross of Jesus would be unnecessary. But there is no other way. And as we follow in that way, we share God's glory. Yet asking God to be glorified in us, well, that could be risky. How do we respond when that glory for us is agony? Do we say, save me from this hour? The answer was no for Jesus. I believe it's no for us as well. We believers are not protected from pain. We have no insurance policy protecting us from life's challenges. I've seen the challenges of many of our Calvary folks, who, by the way, are simply the best folks that anybody could ever know. And I can tell you that the challenges are real. And our response to, to life's curveballs can, can burn up a great deal of shallowness, that's good, or it can lead to bitterness, that's not so good. And so I think it all depends on our perspective, our motive. And when we look at Jesus, we see that Jesus was not saved from the hour. He was saved for it. And so are we. I was talking to one of our Sunday school leaders about a new class the other day, and I said, well, you know, maybe, maybe this is your time. Perhaps the Lord God has placed you here for such a time as this. Of course, I stole that phrase from one of my favorite Old Testament books, the book of Esther. It comes from the scene in chapter 4 of Esther where her life is at stake. And she has been called to step up at great risk to save her people. And just as she was wavering, old Mordecai reminds her, if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. For such a time as this. That was Esther's hour. This was Jesus' hour. The Greek word that's used here for judgment means crisis or discrimination. Now was the moment of crisis for Jesus. This was decision day. Decision day. You know, too often it seems the, the color of this topsy-turvy world we live in is sort of a, a pale gray where ethics are situational and absolute truth is on some sort of sabbatical. And the world doesn't seem to really like to decide. A lady named Dorothy Sayers, who was a colleague of C.S. Lewis, once wrote, in the world it's called tolerance, but in hell it's called despair. The sin that believes in nothing cares for nothing, seeks to know nothing, interferes with nothing, enjoys nothing, hates nothing, finds purpose in nothing, lives for nothing, and remains alive 
because there is nothing for which it will die. How different with Jesus. It was judgment time, and the judge was about to take their just deserts, our just penalty upon himself. And Jesus was making a decision that changed everything for everybody forever. And this hour of his destiny and of his death would be like a flash of lightning, suddenly lighting up the whole cosmos with the love of God. Yet his entry into Jerusalem was not in anticipation of being crowned, but of being crucified. And it was the ultimate example of supreme courage, knowing he was going willingly, sacrificially, and lovingly to his death on our behalf as our ransom, as our substitute. And he did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for everyone. So this morning, what is the passion of Jesus? It's you. You are the passion of Jesus. That is the primary point this morning. Jesus loves you. Just as you are, sinking in your sin, far from the peaceful shore, drowning with no chance of getting there on your own, you are Jesus' passion. You. My first recollection of Tony Campolo was a, was a TV spot, boy, this was a long time ago, that he did for some organization doing some sort of kingdom work with children in Swaziland or, or someplace like that. And I remember watching him. I'd never seen him before. He had on a light tan corduroy sport coat. He had a blue button-down Oxford shirt. He had on khakis and Weegians. In other words, he was my kind of guy. So I, so I, I listened. But as I listened, I thought to myself, wow. This guy is on fire. And maybe he was, because when he was done, it looked like somebody had turned a fire hose on him. He got so worked up, as Tony Campolo does, that he was soaking wet. And I remember thinking, goodness, he needs my antiperspirant. But my, oh my, I wish I had that guy's passion. Years later, I was sitting with Bob Baker at a Baptist meeting in Elizabethtown, and we heard Tony Campolo speak. And he admitted that he's a very passionate man. He said part of it was his Italian blood, but mostly, he said, it's Jesus' example. Jesus, he said, even that day, his sweat was sort of running down his face. Jesus loves you enough to give you not what you want, but exactly what you need. And he illustrated it that day with a political reference. And this is what he said. He said, the difference in Republicans and Democrats is this. If you're drowning 100 feet from the shore, a Republican throws you 50 feet of rope and says, you do the rest. A Democrat throws you 200 feet of rope and then lets go of his end. In both cases, you drown. But Jesus will throw you the exact length of rescue line you need, and he will never, ever let go of his end. Why? Because Jesus himself is the perfect rescue line, and he loves you more than you could ever, ever imagine. If you were the only person in this world, he still would have come and died for you. As Wayne Ward, God rest his soul, used to say even from this pulpit, Jesus would rather go to hell for you than to heaven without you. And such love, such passion for the likes of you and me. How amazing, how divine. Jesus loves you. That's the good news. There's no better news. That's it. Well, it wasn't a 15-point sermon this morning on manna, God's provision for the children of Israel in the wilderness. Just one point today. The love of Jesus God's provision for you and for me for all eternity. Jesus loves you. One point. That's it, George. You, you, you are the passion of the Christ. One point this morning. Hope you got it. Jesus loves you.
Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, as we gather here today and all over, we could be at the very beginning of this life. Lord, we could be heading home. We could be anywhere in between. But your love for us never changes. And Calvary's cross makes that so very real. And our step of faith, our response to your love, seals that love relationship both now and forever. Would you grant us the wisdom? Would you grant us the courage? Would you grant us the passion to love as we are loved? And this we pray in the name of Jesus who is the Lord of love. Amen.